You are listening to the Independent Dealer Podcast with hosts Luke Godwin and Jeff Watson. Glad to have you here, Greg. Uh, Introduce yourself to everyone. Yeah, Greg Barrett. Uh, Guys, thanks. First of all, again, thanks for having me. Uh, Great podcast you guys have here. Um, So we've got, as you guys stated, eight total stores, seven in Ohio, northern Ohio. Uh, one in Charlotte, North Carolina. The one in Charlotte, North Carolina is, I will take zero credit for. That is all our partner, Sean, that's down there, does 100% of the work and a, and a really nice job. But um, yeah, been at it for a little over 25 years. Uh, uh, you know, you guys asked for a little history. Uh, I don't know too many car guys that spent a ton of time in college. Um So my mom avoided that big debt for me and said, you are not going to do well in school. Let's go, (laughs) let's go get you a job. (laughs) And, uh, I was in Milford, Michigan. I worked for general motors at their proving grounds, which was, was pretty neat and quickly realized that corporate America was not for me. My dad lived in Ohio and I moved here and good family friends of ours had a buy rider franchise. And, uh, that was in 98 and I started selling cars for buy rider and, I was always a pretty altruistic person. I really enjoyed helping people. Um, And I grew up dirt poor. So making money in the car business was also attractive. Um, And without boring you with the rest of the details, my business partner called me in 03. I was working for a family business and uh, asked me if I wanted a a bigger challenge. And uh, him and I partnered up and uh, our first store was in September of 2003. We opened our Akron location, uh, took a lot of bumps and bruises, learned a lot along the way. Um, can we just, it's kind of gross. Can can we stop you there in 03? So, uh, you were first, so you were working at the proving grounds in, in, uh, I guess in Michigan, what were you doing for GM at the time? So I was working in their fleet department. You want to talk about a terrible idea. So I was kind of a degenerate. 18 year old kid and they gave us they gave us the 3 30 to 8 30 shift all management left at 5 30 and we had the keys to 4500 prototypes so what'd you do just drive them around trying to which is kind of why that career ended abruptly uh (laughs) yeah man i mean we had i mean they had 18 racetracks on the on the property i mean i mean this was a if you've ever been to the proving grounds if you're ever in milford michigan Mm. check it out it's it's a it's that they've got their own police, their own fire, their own water, a uh, really unique experience. Um, so yeah, we were, that's what we did. We just moved cars from lot to lot from uh, different engineering facilities and had a lot so, of fun. So yeah, we we were trying to guess the car you were in and, and it's a GM and it's a performance GM. Do, do you, uh, are you a GM guy because you were able to, you know, drive those cars and, and started your career in that? No, I am. Uh, I was, you know, growing up in Michigan, I will tell you that it is, you know, Ford or GM and people are pretty brute about that. Uh, and I was a GM guy for a long time. And when I started having kids in 2010, GM, I'm six foot five. They're, they're trucks and SUVs that, the cab room stunk. You couldn't put a car seat behind me driving. Um, and I bought a Ford pickup and that's, I drive an F three fifty every day. Okay. All right. So, so you, uh, you, you had too much fun at the proving grounds. Uh, you left there, you went to Ohio and, and you kind of said you started working at the JD buy rider store. How long were you there selling cars? I was there for two and a half years. Okay. Um, and, and did you stay in the car business? Uh, and then this, your business partner call you or, or had you gone to do something else in between? So I was, I had, I had always, you know, on uh, every other weekend I'd come down to Ohio and spend some time with my dad and he always had an auto repair shop, small car lot, uh, or a gas station or a combination of the three. And, uh, we, I had spent probably about a solid six, eight months working for him, uh, running a very small car dealership at that time. And I don't know if any of you have ever worked for family, but it's a, that's a death sentence for somebody. Yes, it is. I'm still doing it. <laughs> <laughs> working with family, I should say. Um, 
yeah, I, I get the working with the dad. It's it's tough. Yeah, it was it was a challenge. So when the so when so when the partner the, this business partner reached out to you, you were selling cars, working at a family place. Did you did you guys go straight into an uh, to buy a JD Byrider franchise, or did you start independent before you got into the JD Byrider system? Straight into Byrider. So I had I met Chris uh, when we were him and I both worked for the same Byrider. Mm. Uh, it's funny. One of the guys that was at the meeting I was just at was the son of the guy that we used to work for. Um, still very close with them. Uh, and they had eight stores at the time, uh, really respected the family. Um, and that's where I was introduced to Chris. So when he called me, just his exact words, I'll never forget. Are you ready to, are you ready for a real challenge? Cause what you're doing is really not a challenge. <laughs> and he was right by writers. Uh, this was a challenge. Well, so do you, I mean, when you started a by writer franchise um, on your own, and I know that that, that area of the country, um, that's kind of, you know, kind of where they started. Um, did it take a lot of capital to invest to open up it, open up the store? Or was it, did they kind of have a, a way for you to do it without a huge amount of money to start with? So when I, when I went to work for Chris, I was not an investor at the time. So I worked for Chris for two years before we A, grew, and B, I became a partner. However, mm. I yes, it's really capital intensive. I mean, it's it was and more expensive then. Um, and him and I had known a gentleman that actually was an investor in the buy rider that we worked for, a uh, guy by the name of Roy Lewis, uh, still alive today, in his late 80s, uh, wonderful man opened up a, he was one of the oldest Nissan dealers in Ohio, um, was an investor in the business and, and we ended up buying him out later on. That's neat that, that you were able to, to start like that. So Oh three, you open up, uh, you and Chris, you all start the first one. Um, and you said it, it took a little while to, to figure it out and get it going. You know, what's the next step? When did store two appear? Store two appeared in 2005. Uh, it was another opportunity and it was, it was kind of strange. The guy who we worked for, he, he loved to sell cars. Um, and that's great, uh, in retail, uh, not always the greatest plan to buy here, pay here. Uh, and they couldn't outrun, you know, the sales pace just couldn't outrun the charge off. And so unfortunately, they started going out of business and that's how we got the opportunity with the, the Mansfield location. Um, and that was in 2005. Uh, it had some personnel, so it made it a little bit easier. Um, we hired the rest, trained the rest and kind of moved along. So it sounds like, and is that kind of the pattern? If we fast forward a few more years, are you every couple of years picking up, a, a location or are you starting any of these? Or are you picking up ones that maybe have floundered? Uh, and and it, that definitely leads me to the point of the turnaround situation. That sounds super interesting, but what, what was the, what was the progress for picking these stores up? Yeah, they were all, every store that we have was run by somebody that drove it straight into the ground. Mm. Huh. Wow. So, so, it, so was a, it was a, if the buy here, pay here market's not challenging enough, it's even more challenging when you're hitched to a a reputation where yeah. customer service wasn't there, yeah. um, integrity wasn't always there. You probably got some bad apples running around that you had to uh, give us that strategy. Why, why, why go in and, and try to pick up a, a dead, you know, <laughs> why pick up a project car? You know, why buy something with a bad engine and a bad transmission? It was cheaper. <laughs> but I mean, the, the facility was good there. Point, they, were point, painted, they had signs. I mean, it was, yeah. I mean, it just made sense. So um, then what's the playbook? What's the yeah, playbook when you go yeah, great. What When you walk into it, what's the first thing you do? And is it the same thing every time? Man, it's, it's, at, we're a big culture company and uh, we've always been really tight with, the staff and you know, I always I say today it's the shittiest, crappiest, sorry, thing about growing is 
you know, you, you get the, the more you grow, the more locations you have, the further away you get from those touch points with all your people. But, you know, really the, the strategy for us with growing was finding somebody that uh, obviously wanted to work hard. B had a, an immense amount of ownership in the model, uh, the by rider model and wanted to do it better than anybody else. Um, and so we just, man, we would, we always looked to hire somebody that had never made the kind of money we were willing to pay them that never mm -hmm. had the opportunity that we were going to provide them. And man, I'm not going to tell you that we've never hired anyone with good credit, but I will tell you the vast majority have bad credit. Mm -hmm. Um, because we wanted them to, we wanted them to be able to relate to the, to our guests, to our customers. Ho, 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 Jeff. Ho, ho. It's uh, tax time. I know you like it. It's getting to be it there. Is. <laughs> it is Christmas time and tax time. Uh, so that means it's the fourth quarter program. I spent all morning uh, training our sales staff on how to do the fourth quarter program for our preferred customers. If, you, if you've got a loan with us, if you've got an account, you want to upgrade, get a second vehicle. It's a great opportunity for those folks where they don't have any money because Christmas is coming. And hopefully they've given all the extra money to you to keep current on their car payment. But they can do a deferred down with their fourth quarter uh, estimate of their upcoming tax return. Yeah. And, and if you can't, if you can't stomach that, get ready for the first quarter, because I know that I've had a couple slow Januaries, but this January, we're going to be wide open and we're going to use tax max to make that happen. So when you pick up these locations, is that, are you typically moving over like a key manager from a current store so that the culture transfers or are these mostly like new location, new hire, and, and uh, I'm going to train them up to, to work even though they're 30 or 50 miles away from the main store? No. So luckily all of our stores, even today are from my house, I can be at any of our stores and then I can be at five of them in 40 minutes. One of them's mm -hmm. an hour and a half away. Um, and I've been to Charlotte twice, um, which speaks volumes for Sean. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that when we were small, and I would call small up through five stores, we, <laughs> we just hired, we just lived in that store for 90 days to six months. You know, the mm -hmm. culture was great at the first store. The leadership was good. The staff was fantastic. And so we really were able to mirror you know, store two to store one, because we would just dedicate the amount of time that we'd go spend, you know, in that rooftop for X amount of time. Hmm. That sounds so interesting to me. What, what did you, with these models and when you bring on a new store, is each store kind of like, are they a standalone? Do they have their own, uh, you know, buyers, recon sales collections, or is it, do you do like re recon from a central location and send cars out? What's, what's kind of the model on the logistics? So if you fast forward to today, there are some minor differences from when we started. Um, but at every one of our locations today, there is full sales, full service, for fi full finance uh, wow. under, one, under one roof. Yeah, we're, that's one of the things that, you know, I'll be forever grateful that Byrider taught us um, and then somehow abandoned, but uh, <laughs> is man, it is, it's a relationship. Like it is a hundred percent about, you know, that one-on-one -on -one relationship with the customer. And so we adopted the, call it cradle to grave, uh, sales collections under one roof, uh, mm. and never left. Wow. So you have yeah, seven I, I, locations within 30, 45 minutes of each other ish that all have their own service centers, repair shops, Equipment, is that re software. Is that, yeah, is that recon too? Recon too. Now we do have a reconditioning center that we opened two years ago. Okay. Um, we bought a we bought a new car store, new car building, I should say. It was a new car store that's fairly close to us, right on the interstate. And uh, we had a location there, and the traffic counts there are absurd, but it's. You know, it's a four lane road where the speed limit's 55 and everybody thinks it says 75. Mm -hmm. And I think that while the location was great, it was just terrible for, for us. And we bought the location. So we put a paint booth in there. We put a, you know, redid the service department. And if you fast forward to today, we've got my partner is there every day. Um, we've got a service manager, a service assistant, five techs, five body techs, a detailer, 
and our controller in its ish, our corporate office. Um, but I'm in a, I'm in a different store every day. That's super interesting. You would think um, that collections in a centralized location would save you a lot of money, but it may on the other hand, cost you a lot of money because you don't get the hands on with the customer. I guess that's what you're seeing by being in the store. Um, and then having, uh, um, I can see why you would have recon at one facility, but I guess having warranty repair and things like that at, at on on site with each store uh, is very. It helps with collection. It helps with with that. Is that is that what you see? Yeah, it's. You know, I always I interviewed three people this morning, and I, I feel like a broken record. I've done a lot of interviewing lately, but I you know I always talk about the same things with our. Are it, the folks that we're interviewing is it's like, man, yeah, you're interviewing for sales. Yes, you're interviewing for service and finance, but really it's we're in education and problem solving is all we do all day long. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that with that at our core, having everything under one roof is super helpful purely because it's we've we've got a very good culture surrounding it's everybody's job and it's advancement. Like there's, you know, you have the start line and the finish line and our goal is to get them to the finish line. So I don't care who's, who's answering the phone or what you're doing, but we've got to be ready to solve a problem at all times. That is a big, uh, if you can hire people in buy here, pay here that understand that problem solving is, is our number one uh, asset in our business, then you can make money in buy here, pay here, right? If you don't, if yeah. everybody, if if everybody thinks that, oh no, uh, if a salesperson thinks that, oh no, helping a customer figure out the service or the collection issue isn't their problem, you're not going to have a good culture and you're not going to have good payers, right? No, that is absolutely correct. And we've, you know, over the years, I can tell you, we've learned the hard way. You know, there's been, we had our a store at our, our Worcester store, we had opened two stores at the same time. Uh, and we couldn't spend as much time in one store. And I, mean, you, I think we all know in this business, a you know, one bad apple can cause a, a lot of big problems. Um, and it was so bad that that we realized it's, man, it is genuinely all about the people and good or bad. Yeah, for sure. It's you, you can't even get rid of the bad person fast enough, right? No. <laughs> I want to know, it, 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 you say, you know, the culture and obviously it looks like having the whole uh, A to B type, the, the whole, you know, recon, sales, collections, everything in each location was crucial. I'm really curious, when you went in and you you took those dying locations, was there anything else that made it so you could make those locations successful when the old operator wasn't making them successful I mean, did you change anything else as far as the deal structure, the advertising, the, you know, put up big inflatable gorillas? What was it that made those work for you? Bit, yeah, I, it was, man, honestly, it was all culture. It, it was just a hundred percent grit and determination to recondition. You know, I think I told people all the time working for an operation that sucks prior to was probably the best thing that ever happened. I mean, I think you go work for the greatest operation ever. A, I might've still been there. B, uh, you just, you don't learn as much. And so when we started to open our stores, we were like, well, if we don't want to go bankrupt, let's not do this. Let's not do that. You know, you, you talked about deal structure. We have been deal structure misers since day one. I mean, we pay attention to expenses. We pay attention to deal structure uh, really well. I mean, I can tell you that in between down payment and deferred down payment, we're still one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you know, in buy rider, uh, at getting it up front, getting it early, getting them committed, uh, and building that relationship to get them to advance. Hey, real quick, uh, make sure you have your reinsurance company set up right now with Buckeye. Fun fact, Luke, I'm actually going through the process right now. So as long as we've had Buckeye as a sponsor, I have not actually been using their service, even though I love the guys and they give me all sorts of advice and I attend everything they do. 
I'm actually now switching my reinsurance company over to Buckeye. So it's been a, it's been a, a fairly painless process thus far. So I'll keep you guys updated on how it goes, but switching from one reinsurance company to another, there are some nuances, but I don't think it's quite as scary as a lot of people think. No, I went through it at the first of this year. Um, I moved from someone I'd been with for 10 years and and moved to Buckeye. And I can tell you this, they made it so easy. Uh, Jason and Brett and Sean and, and Rob, everybody over there, they really, they go all out. They help you get it done. Um, don't be afraid of it. It's not a big deal. You can answer this if you want to, but you don't have to. Um, someone like you, and you've been with JD by Rider since since the beginning. Um, why not go out on your own to start with? Number one, uh, and number two, why why stay with them this long? So I will, yeah, man, that's a great question, and I don't have a problem answering that at all. Uh, we got into this business and didn't have the playbook. Um, you know, I was 24 years old when I got into this business and you don't have the, the playbook. Uh, I think that it's a litigious business. There's a lot to worry about. There's a lot of laws. There's a lot of regulation. Uh, we liked the, the knowledge and the playbook that they gave you. You know, I give people that this example all the time. Um, I'm on the dealer board for buy rider and there's, you know, the tenure, uh, in our franchisee crew is it's deep. I mean, it's the guys on the board have, we've got a combined 200 years in this business and we've all became, you know, I think the student becomes the teacher at some point. Um, and I'm bought, I mean, at this point we've got 25 years in, in marketing pumped into buy rider. Um, and I just genuinely believe in the brand. Uh, could we go do it on our own and, and make more money? Oh, probably we pay a lot of money in royalties, but mm. you're not going to learn how to do it better with a, a better playbook and uh, more support than Byrider has has provided over the years. So, so I was we mentioned this uh, in, in one of our previous meetings. Luke and I were together, and the, the obviously the Byrider corporate stores are kind of hitting a speed bump. It sounds like um, where where Byrider gives you the proprietary type software, I think you know your DMS is all built internally. Is that something where I mean, do you back that file up every single night, not knowing if it's going to turn on in the morning? No. Okay. There's like there's there's fail safes in there from a corporate level that if they turn the lights off, you're still safe. Your 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 livelihood, your structure, your portfolio, and everything can function regardless i'm guessing yes and no uh okay. i think that i'm probably just more in tune with what's really going on and, and more comfortable with the situation okay so that, yeah that's fair that's fair for sure like from the outside looking in you'd see something and be like oh it's going to be the next you know american car center or whatever one of these joints that just close the doors at five o'clock on a friday right you have very very inside intimate knowledge of how healthy the corporate store is and and all the kind of happenings there on the backside i'm sure yeah i mean i think without talking too far out of school and it's you know i gotta tread lightly but i think that uh you know by got into the balance sheet business instead of just being a you know a franchisor and the reality is they should have just been a franchisor that's what the family did so well for so many years and I think that that's that was the that was the downfall, so to speak. They detached all those things that I just talked about, gave us all that success. They detached from all of that. You know, yeah. they took the people Culture. out of the stores. They took they took the relationship out of the customer. They were, you know, their collections from all over the place. And you know, I think the intentions were good. Um, the results, not so I, much. I have a question about that because. It, you know, I don't, Jeff, I don't think we've spoken to anyone that, that, that is in the situation that you are, Greg. And I often wonder this because it seems like what makes our business work is culture and, and your, your definite, you know, your success story of the, of the culture and how it works. How does a company like Drive Time do it? Because there's, there's not family in the store. How can it work for them and then not work for the other people like we just mentioned that have been out of business and, you know, in, in, in corporate buy rider and another 
corporations like that? Man, that's a great question. Uh, I'm going to guess that, that they've just, I mean, I think volume helps. I think uh, volume in the right fashion helps. And I'm sure, I don't know a ton about drive time, but I'm sure that they've got some policies, processes, and procedures that they train and hold accountable really well. Uh, I mean, I, nobody grows at that rate and has a, the success that they've had without something. And I think that there are plenty of successful businesses that have shitty cultures, but the reality is it's man, the, in the buy here. And I think that they've also gotten away from deep subprime. Hmm. You know, I think that they're they're. I don't think they're as deep as they once were. And they're certainly not as deep as we are. Yeah, I, th I think so. I, th I think that uh, the move into the higher inventory that they did, it, it kind of takes you out of the, out of that deep subprime. Um, how big are you now? Like how many accounts do y'all have? And, you know, volume, uh, Five, and we've got about, we've got about 62 million in receivables and we've got, oh, 5,400 and change accounts. Yeah. How many people do y'all have total working for you? 107. And you know that number right off the top of your head. I love that. <laughs> well, I I was doing projections all day, and uh, so I've been I've been living in that. But I would have said 110 before I sat down this morning. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I got to got That's a tough time of year to trim that, huh? <laughs> what? Uh, <Yeah. laughs> it, uh, RB, are you CEO? Or are you uh, CEO emeritus? What, what kind of what is your role day to day? COO. I run day-to-day -day operations. I run, uh, I underwrite half of our stores. Uh, we, man, I'm, I'm a, I'm a firefighter. Sometimes yeah. I'm a policeman. <laughs> I'm, you, you know, the drill. I mean, it's, uh, yes, I do. On a bad day. I'll tell you, we, you know, if we didn't have employees and customers, this would be a great business. Um, <laughs> I tell Luke that all the on time. I said, we should have started something that had no customers, no products that were out yeah. driving around trying to smash into each other. They're controlled explosions. Uh, you're heating them up. You're cooling them down. And people are ripping them 90 miles down the freeway with no insurance. It's like yeah. the craziest. Yeah, model. it's my favorite thing is when I get passed by a customer, we just sold a car to with our sticker on the back going 95 miles an hour down the highway in and out of traffic. <laughs> yeah, it's so great, isn't it? I, I wait for the day when I get when I get into an accident with one of my own customers. That, that's got to be some sort of milestone <laughs> or an award for somebody when they get T-boned by someone with their plates, their license plate frame or something. Please, please knock on wood, please. Oh, yeah. yeah. And you know... Jeff, Santa brings cash sometimes too, and and we all need cash. Do you need some cash? I would prefer the Santa Claus only brought cash. <laughs> I just I find that I have no need for anything else but money these days. Um, yeah, so the guys at Primal End, ho ho ho, they they could be your Santa Claus and bring you money if you need it. Yeah, um, those guys will help you out. They'll look at your books. They'll figure out if you actually need cash or what you could do to be better at managing the cash you have. Um, but if you need cash, you can't wait. You have to be prepared for it. You have to know. You have to see it coming. Um, I knew I was going to need cash this year. And Jeff, I thought I had enough. And guess what? I didn't, didn't. have enough. Mm -hmm. So be prepared. Uh, call Primalin. They will help you figure it out. So, Greg, I mean, you've made a bunch of bunch of great decisions. Is there anything that you would say is maybe a misstep or somewhere maybe you didn't like you didn't quite take advantage of the situation? Like, you know, maybe you just put one foot in instead of jumping in full speed. Anything like that? Yeah, I would say no, uh, no, but yes, and there's there's a caveat to that. And, and I would say no, because I think we're pretty firm believers in, you know, the the problems that you encounter, the bad decisions you make, if you're open to learning a lesson and adapting quickly and changing, um, it's what got us to where we are today. And I'm I'm kind of a quirky believer and everything happens for a reason. So um I can tell you that, you know, one of the biggest mistakes we ever made uh, was deciding that we're car guys at heart and we got into high end. We got into the high end car business mm. probably in 2012 and we started wholesaling, you know, 
Porsches, Ferraris, Lamborghinis. And that was, that was a ton of fun. And it introduced <laughs> like this whole new landscape and we didn't make a dime and our buy rider suffered. And we, I mean, it, we kept it open for a year. We wound it down. Um, no catastrophes. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I, you know, I think I remember Roy Lewis telling us this when we got into this business, he said, um, you know, figure out what you do and do it. Well, you can only do one thing really well. And while I, I would disagree with that in some areas when you're in buy here, pay here, I, if there are people that do multiple things and do it really well, God bless them. I mm -hmm. could, yeah. I, I totally agree. I have been distracted, and my dad is the worst at getting distracted. He loves classic cars. He gets distracted there. Um, but I tell you, if I would have put all my effort into this business from day one and not gotten sidetracked by trying to retail cars or do this or that, I, how much further I would be ahead right now is kind of mind-blowing. Um, and there's a lot to be said because what we do, I, my wife always reminds me of this, and she, she, of course, is the smartest person I know. Um she listens every week too. But um if Luke, you're you're not running one business, you're running like six or seven businesses. And so to think that you don't have enough going on is ridiculous because we're buying the cars, we're reconning the cars, we're selling the cars, we're financing the cars, then we have CPI, then we have the warranty company. There's all this going on. It's not just one business, right? No, it's uh it is this business is not for everybody. And I think, you know, that really lends credence to being a buy rider franchise. You know, you guys, mm -hmm. God bless you. I know you guys run really, really good operations. Um, and could again, could we have done it? I, yeah, I just feel like that curve would have been so much steeper and so much longer and so much more expensive. Oh, yeah. yeah. I definitely know when I got in in 05, there was a lot of learning curve between 05 and 08, 2010, right? A lot of lost money, a lot of bad debt where I'd be further ahead. Greg, to wrap this up, give give the dealers listening any any advice or words of wisdom or, uh, you know, the things you did do right in your career that you think dealers should follow. Man, I think that... Uh... You know, I got a really good opportunity to partner up with Chris and I, you know, I made mention to this earlier. I didn't have, I had a wonderful family growing up, but not a, no money. My poor mother made $9,000 a year. And so when I got this opportunity, I took it seriously and I've given, we've given so many wonderful opportunities to staff members that were making 10, 12 bucks an hour that a year later made 75, $80,000. Um, we pay our people really well and we treat our people even better um and that would be literally my one piece of advice i'm one guy i got seven locations i my business partner is you know at this stage in his life is able to to relax a little bit more which means i can't relax as much mm -hmm. um i need every single one of those people i was talking to one of my technicians yesterday and he's i was doing projections and he, he came in to say hi and I was chit-chatting with him and he's like, oh man, numbers. I am no good at numbers. And I said, well, Toreen, the good news is I can't fix cars. So <laughs> between the two of us, we make the world go round. Um, and I think it's, it's, I couldn't speak enough and I could talk for another hour about how incredible our people are. It's a hundred percent our staff. That is, that is something great to talk about and to discuss right here around Christmas time, how great your people are and what they do for us. And hopefully we do the same thing for them. Uh, Jeff, I, that's a great place yeah. to end it. It is. It is. Greg, thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Guys, thanks for having me. Have Thank a Merry you. Christmas. You too. Dealers Helping Dealers. Please leave us a review and subscribe. The Independent Dealer Podcast. He was really good. Really yeah. good. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a that's a pretty interesting situation. That's for sure. And yeah, I mean, as much as he talked about culture, he believes it. He lives it. Hmm. It does make me think uh, that whole thing: hire the best, pay them well, and expect. But like, you I know, think, you, you I know, a lot of said. dealers. I think we hire mediocrity because that's the cheapest thing we can find, and then we just like to walk around like 
the big roosters of the roost because we're the ones that can do everything and everyone else is incompetent. We just have like a bunch of a bunch of C players that make us feel like the A players. I don't know. Yeah, but one one other thing you said was hiring people with bad credit too, you know, and 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 I've I've done this a couple of times is you take people that when they started with you that had a couple of dead end type careers. Yeah. And they never really made over about 30 grand. And then next thing you know, you're paying these people 60, 70,000, 80,000 dollars a year. And they are all in. You know what I yeah. mean? Like it's yeah. something to be said about that too. But those are still, I mean, you're still finding people who are competent and capable. Oh yeah. Yeah, for sure. They might just be overextended or over leveraged. You're not finding like, you know, it's not typically our customer who is bad credit and also doesn't show up to work on time. Yeah. No, and no, no. also yeah. can't hold down a job. Yeah. I think you're like he said, I mean, maybe it's those people that are just really grateful to prove themselves. I, I don't know. I just, I guess I just keep going back to like, I mean, look at your taxes. What are you going to pay this year? Ridiculous. A lot. Could you imagine if you paid a little bit less and had way more competent people because you were just willing to pay well, a couple actually, fucks not a gonna, little bit more? Not going to pay as much this year. I, I was looking at our income compared to last year. It's not so good. Hmm. But but what what I the reason is because our twenty twenty one and two were so bad that our interest income has dipped so much. But I can see that 25, later part of 25, and is going to be, is going to hurt. Anyway, from an income tax, standpoint, tax, tax wise. Yeah. Tax wise. Yeah. I can see it. I can already see the, the trajectories is we're back to income, uh, interest income of where we were in, in 01. So hmm. anyway, okay. these meds. <laughs>